When the night is holding on to me, God is holding on. How many of you parents remember when your kids were little and you would take them on walks and you'd hold their hand and they'd try to do things? You know, they try to jump into the puddle or they try to jump over something they couldn't jump over. And it was our holding onto their hands that kept them from falling, right? Because if we let go, which I will confess to you once in a while, I did let go on purpose. <laughs> but when we let go, but when we hold on, they're held tight. And that's what that line was saying. What a powerful line. When the dark of night is holding onto us, God holds us in the palm of his hand. What a great thought. Take your Bibles this morning and turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. We're going to read verses 1 through 4 specifically today. And actually, we're going to not necessarily take apart this text as much as look at a lot of uh, places in the book of Ecclesiastes that talk about our topic. And so this will be a little bit different. But chapter 7 says this. A good name is better than precious ointment. And the day of death than the day of birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of face the heart is made glad. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. This is God's word. Yesterday, I officiated the memorial service for Ed DiBernardo uh, of our church. He was 78. Ed came to know the Lord later on in his life through our church. And uh, in fact, he told me a few weeks ago, this was just a, a precious story. I was visiting him and he said, boy, I just want to thank you. You saved me. And I said, no, Ed, the Lord saved you. And he thought about that for a minute. He said, well, you had a big part in it. And I said, okay, I'll take that. But actually, I was thinking about it. It was actually Lauren Furch, Jeannie's dad, a uh, longtime member here, who originally invited him to our services. And the amazing thing is this. Once he showed up, he never left. Until about three weeks ago when the cancer in his body just zapped him of all his strength and he could no longer attend. And I just want to stop there and say this parenthetically. You just never, ever, ever know what can happen when you invite someone to come to worship with you? Easter's a few weeks away. I don't know what it is in the heart of man that for some reason they'll come to church on Easter. And what a great day to leverage with people for the gospel. See, when people get around the gospel and they get around the power of the gospel, the power of God's word, the power of the spirit working in people's lives, God works in incredible ways. And so let me just encourage you. Easter's coming up. Invite someone to Easter with you. It would be incredible if everybody in this room brought one person with them. You say, we wouldn't be able to fit. That's true. Wouldn't that be a great problem to have? So let me just say that. Let me put that little plug in. But I visited him, I think, two days. Yeah, this is Ed. I visited him two days before he passed, and what he said to me was incredible. He said, I hated missing church last week, but I'm planning on being there this week. I mean... And in the years of the ministry that God has used me in, I don't know that I've ever met anyone who was so joyful in, in facing death as Ed was. I mean, he was really ready to meet the Lord. And I've seen other people that have died well, don't get me wrong. But he was not only ready, he was excited about it. I would say to him, Ed, how are you doing? And he'd say, I'm great. I don't know how much time I have left, but I'm ready to see Jesus. You know, one of the things that sets us apart as God's children is our view of death. Paul teaches us in 1 Thessalonians when, that when the believer looks at death, we certainly grieve. It really does hurt to lose someone. But we don't grieve in the same way as those who do not have the hope that Jesus gives. And we know that this life is not all there is. We know that our future hope is seeing Jesus and being with him. 
15 times in the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon directly discusses the subject of death, and then it is indirectly referred to about 25 more times. And that could be the result of Solomon's age. Solomon was getting up in age, so it is normal for a person as they get older to think more about death and what that means. It's also likely due to the fact that there was a spiritual decline in his life and, and that brought the subject of death to such a place of prominence in his mind. But he really talked about two things in the passage we just looked at. He talked about what he called the house of feasting and the house of mourning. And he was using that to describe two ways of viewing life. And really, when I read about it, it made me think of two things that I get to be a part of. I get to be a part of weddings, and I get to be a part of funerals. I was talking to my mom the other day, and I was talking that, you know, we had a, I had a funeral that I was going to participate in, and, and I was going to lead, and, you know... She said, oh, I'm so sorry. I said, you know, the truth is, Mom, I would much rather do a funeral than a wedding any day. She said, my mom said, why? <laughs> I said, well, think about it. The, the, the wedding is the house of feasting. It's really kind of self-focused on the bride and the groom. And, and it is a time of joy, and it's a wonderful time. But, but you leave a wedding often just thinking, man, that was great. That was wonderful. They got it. That was beautiful. But it's, it's kind of very focused on that event. And, and honestly, I've learned this about weddings. There's nobody listening to anything I say, especially the bride and groom. They just want to kiss and leave the wedding. <laughs> but in the house of mourning, which in some translations it actually calls it a funeral. See, in those times, the heartbroken and the empty are so willing to listen to the gospel and so needing God to give them peace in their lives. And that's why I would rather do a funeral than a wedding. Now, that doesn't mean I don't want to do your wedding if you want to get married someday. Come on, we'll do it. It'll be great, all right? <laughs> but do you understand what I'm saying? People often leave a funeral taking something with them, thinking about life and death and mortality and immortality. See, death is an unpopular subject, but it is an incredibly important subject because of how short life is and how long eternity is. James tells us this. He says, you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. So the purpose of this message is not to be morbid, but it is to help us to discover the real value of thinking about what is going to happen at the end of this life and beyond. Again, we're not going to just look at this text. We're going to look at several verses in the book of Ecclesiastes where Solomon speaks of death. And I hope that we'll all realize that the way that we view death has a great impact on how we live this life. And so in Ecclesiastes, Solomon gives us first some human perspectives about death. Uh, many people only see death from a purely human perspective. And that is what Solomon does when he looks at it as being under the sun. And so let me share with you uh, four human theories about life after death. The first is this. Death is certain. Death is certain. And that theory is absolutely true, isn't it? I mean, Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 2.16, For of the wise... As of the fool, there is no enduring remembrance, seeing that in the days to come all will have been long forgotten. How the wise dies just like the fool. You see, everybody has to face the fact that death is going to occur. No one cheats death. I mean, you're familiar with the saying that there are only two things in life that are, are certain. That's death and taxes. Well, you can cheat on your taxes, but you cannot cheat death. The Bible says in Psalm 89 this, What man can live and never see death? Who can deliver his soul from the power of Sheol? And the obvious answer is no one can. And Woody Allen, the comedian, once said it this way. He said, I'm not afraid to die. I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> I understand that. But the truth is no one can cheat death. It is certain. It is coming for all of us. The second theory is that death is purely physical. Uh, Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes 3.18, I said in my heart with regard to the children of man that God is testing them, 
that they may see that they themselves are but beasts. What Solomon is saying is that in a human perspective, in a, in just by viewing things under the sun, man and animals die just alike. They just stop breathing. And, and when you look at it from that side of life, it seems as if, and many people believe this, that nothing happens to men or animals after they die. They just go back to the ground. And many people believe that. We know it's not true, but that's what many people believe. Another theory is that death is mysterious. And, and many, ecclesia, many people are kind of agnostics when it comes to death. I really don't know what happens. We just know, some may, may, people may think something happens, but we just don't know. Ecclesiastes 3.22, Solomon says, So I saw that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his work, for that is his lot. Who can bring him to see what will be after him? And what he's saying is, if we just look at death, From a purely human perspective, no one can really tell you what happens after death because they haven't been there. Um, That's why books about, um, you know, out-of-body experiences and and people dying and supposedly going to heaven and coming back, that's why they're bestsellers. Some people call them heavenly tourism books. Um, And and the, the truth is they often completely distort the truth of the Bible. They often just completely are wrong biblically. But, but people are just looking for answers to the mystery of what happens after we die. And the sad thing is, sometimes even church people who should know better buy into stuff that is so clearly not biblical. And that's what's so awesome about the Word of God. That's what's so important about the Word of God. This is the only source of truth about life after death that we can trust. Because the author, Jesus Christ, is the only one that has been there and can reveal the mystery to us. But a lot of people just think, well, death is just mysterious. We don't know. We're just agnostic about it. The last theory, humanly speaking, is that death is final. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, Solomon writes, In fact, I'll show you this here on the screens. He says, For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. And they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Their love and their hate and their envy have already perished, and forever they have no more share in all that is done under the sun. Solomon says the dead know nothing. And and according to that statement, it would almost appear as if Solomon is saying that they cease to exist. But remember... He's saying that from a purely human perspective. He's not saying that that is the truth of God. He's saying this is what humanity experiences. And it's still today how so many people view death. Um, let, me, let me give you an example. I'll put a picture up here on the screen. Everybody probably knows who that is. This week, Stephen Hawking died. He was the world's most well-known theoretical physicist. As a matter of fact, I don't know about you, but he's the only theoretical physicist I even knew existed. His body was paralyzed after he was diagnosed with ALS when he was 21 years old. He was given two to three years to live. He actually lived until he was 76 years old. So he far outlived his diagnosis. And he was a brilliant man with a brilliant mind. But he was also an avowed atheist. And who he believed that this life was all that there was. And that death was nothing more than the final termination of our human existence. This is what he said just a couple of years ago. He said, I have lived with the prospect of an earthly death for the last 49 years. I'm not afraid of death, but I'm in no hurry to die. I have so much I want to do first. And this is what he says. I regard the brain as a computer which will stop working when its components fail. And this was his view. He says, there is no heaven or afterlife for broken down computers. That is a fairy story for people who are afraid of the dark. And that view of death that is so prevalent in this world naturally leads people to live life as if this is all there is. So whatever they want to do, no matter what it is, they'll do it. We, we sometimes call it hedonism. But Solomon says, no, this is vanity. It's chasing the wind. And so let's compare those views with the benefits of having a godly understanding of death. 
Chapter 9 speaks quite a bit about life and death. And, and, and we, when we know God's truth about eternity, it helps us to live again right here and right now on earth. A common thought throughout Ecclesiastes as well as the entire scripture is that uh, this life is kind of a dress rehearsal for eternity. And, and so when we come to chapter 9, Solomon wants to talk about some values and priorities when it comes to life after death. He teaches us that this, first of all, as long as there is life, there is hope. Ecclesiastes 9.4 says this, But he who is joined with all the living has hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. The dead have no hope. They have entered eternity. While we who are alive today have a living hope. Peter says it this way, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I mean, the lesson is clear. As long as we have life, we have, no matter how difficult it may be, we can still have an opportunity to find real hope in the truth of God. And it is that hope that we have in our lives, that Christ gives, that teaches us that we can live with an impact for eternity. Ecclesiastes 9.5 says, For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. The best way for us to have an eternal impact is to learn the value of our days, to learn that our time is short, and to use our days according to God's wisdom. That's what Moses prays in Psalm 90. He says, so teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. That means that every day of our life, while we have breath and strength, we should work to invest our lives in things that are eternal. How many of you ever heard the name Richard Vermbrand before? Some of you? Richard Vermbrand, they just put out a movie about him, Voice of the Martyrs. He actually started Voice of the Martyrs. Um, he was tortured mercilessly for 14 years by the communist regime of Romania. And, and he exemplified this living hope. Listen to what he wrote. He said, It was in prison that I found the hope of salvation for communists. It was there that I developed a sense of responsibility toward them. And listen to this. It was in being tortured by them that I learned how to love them. That is someone who was living with a true living hope. And in a, he made an eternal impact on many, many people. The question for us today is this. Do we have the hope that comes from knowing Jesus Christ? I mean, are we living a life of hope that can make an eternal impact? If not, Jesus says to each one of us, come to me, and I will not only forgive your sins and give you life and eternity, but I will also give you a living hope that will enable you to live a life that can make an impact for eternity far beyond your human years. And then Solomon also teaches this, that when we have a godly perspective about death, we can really appreciate the important things of life. In, in chapter number 9, verses 7 through 10, I want you to read these words. It says, Go and eat your bread with joy and drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already approved what you do. Let your garments be always white, let not oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might for there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in the grave to which you are going. Solomon talked about the simple things of life. I mean, he talked about the things that really matter. Eating with your family. Having a joyful heart. Loving your spouse. And investing your life with energy into the work that God has called you to do. And the work that God can bless. I mean, these are the things that really matter. 
as we learned last week, it's not wealth and possessions that really matter, but it's the simple things like food. I'm so glad Solomon put that in there. And drink. And, and culture. And beauty. And most importantly, relationships. You see, these are the things, these are the gifts that God has given us to freely enjoy in this life. And as Lee Iacocca once said, he said, I've never heard someone say on their deathbed that they wish they had spent more time in the office. But many, many, many have wished that they didn't focused on the important things of life. And so when we gain a godly perspective about life and death, it's then that we can really embrace God's two biblical certainties about life and death. You see, there are only two options taught in the Bible when it comes to life after death. There is the way of the believer, and there is the way of the unbeliever. The moment that a person dies, they will either suffer the consequences of the choice they made here in life, or they will enjoy the consequence of what they've chosen for eternity. And the, the issue, the whole thing is centered upon one thing, and that is what choice are we going to make about Jesus Christ? You see, this is, what I'm about to tell you, is the good news and the bad news. In fact, I would say it this way. This is the greatest good news there is, and it is also the worst bad news that there is. First, the Bible teaches this, that there is separation from God in hell for eternity. Folks, hell is no more of a myth than heaven is. According to the Bible, hell is real and it is eternal. Twelve specific times in the New Testament, Jesus talks about the subject of hell because he knew it is every bit as real as heaven. It is a place of physical suffering and emotional and spiritual suffering. Paul speaks of it this way in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. He says, In flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not God, know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. You see, the Bible teaches this as reality, folks. But here's the good news. The truth of the scripture is that God does not desire for anyone to go to hell. Peter says it this way. He says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Every time I read that verse, Jeannie, I think about your dad. They were the last words on Lauren's lips was this verse. I don't know about you, but wouldn't it be amazing to go to see Jesus and the last words out of our mouth are the gospel? And that leads us to the second biblical truth about life after death, and that is this. That yes, there is separation from God and hell for eternity for those who reject Christ. But there is also celebration with God in heaven for eternity. This is why Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 5.8 that believers can have the confidence to know that to be away from our earthly bodies is to be at home in heaven with the Lord. Paul would say, much like Ed or Lauren or so many other saints through the ages that have passed into heaven, that they have a desire to depart and be with Christ that is far better than their desire for life. See, Paul knew that the greatest reality of this life is not this life, but the eternal life he found in Christ, which starts when we receive Christ as our Lord and Savior, which grows as we follow Jesus, and which will one day be completed when we die and we see Jesus face to face. There are two realities taught in the Bible. Now, if you're, if you're like me and you, you kind of have an idea of what people believe in society, you know that the, the spectrum of beliefs and what happens after life and death are just, they're wide. And a lot of people believe with all their heart that what they think is true. In the movie Star Wars, The Force Awakens, there's this poignant scene where... Finn and Ray, they find Han Solo and they take him back 
to the Millennium Falcon, which he hadn't seen in years. And, and they're, they're talking about the Millennium Falcon. They're talking about Luke Skywalker and the Force. And, and they just thought it was all a legend. They thought it was all a myth. And so Han Solo begins to reminisce. And, and they ask about Luke Skywalker and they ask about the Force. And he says, you know, I used to wonder about that myself. I thought it was all a bunch of mumbo jumbo. And he looks at them and he says, but it's true. All of it. The Force, the Jedi, it's all true. Now we know this is just a Hollywood story. This is just fantasy. But folks, listen. The world and its greatest minds, including a man like Stephen Hawking, may think that eternity and heaven and hell are on nothing more than a bunch of mumbo jumbo. But we know that on the basis of God's word, on the basis of the authority of his word and the authority of Christ, folks, listen, it's true. All of it. Heaven and hell, eternity, it's all true. And if we know the truth about death and eternal life and heaven and hell, the question is, what are we going to do about it? If we don't know Christ, will we choose him or will we reject him? If we do know Christ, how will we let this affect our lives? Let me give you two applications and, and we'll be done. First, there is only one way to eternal life. Jesus said in John 14, 6 explicitly, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Folks, there is only one God and there is only one gospel. The, the, the question is, what do we choose? And that is the most important question because none of us knows when death will come our way. Thomas Fuller once said this. He said, you cannot repent too soon because you do not know how soon it may be too late. We only get this one life on earth to choose to follow Christ. So my encouragement to you is this. Do not wait. Follow Christ today. And secondly, the truth is, what the, te the big teaching of Ecclesiastes is this. We are really not ready to live until we are ready to die. Hebrews 9.27 says, And just as it is appointed unto man once to die, after that comes judgment. Keeping the end in mind is what shapes how we live our lives in the here and now. To live the way that God intends, we need to recognize the truth about the only thing in life that is certain and that is death, and let it impact our lives before we get there. See, considering the reality of death helps us to pay attention to our limitations as human beings and to receive life as a wonderful gift from God. And what that does is that then frees us to live humbly and wisely and gratefully and generously and faithfully, and for God's glory, for the good of this world. So today, here's my encouragement. Let's choose today to commit our lives to making an eternal impact in our world by living with eternity in view and following Jesus each and every day. Let's bow for prayer. Lord, your word does not shy away from difficult subjects. And I, for one, am so grateful for that. Because in our world, we often strain and, and, and we get confused about what we are supposed to think. And we're so influenced by culture and entertainment and things like that that, that so many messages get mixed up. And, and sometimes we tend to just disregard things that are difficult and, and fall into the trap of a life of ease. But your word doesn't allow us to do that. Your word speaks to us starkly about the subject of death. Lord, I, I pray 
that your truth about life and death and eternity would first have a great impact on us in the way that we live, the way that we think, the way that we view life, the way that we view people, the way that we view culture and all those things around us, that we would view it through the lens of the glorious gospel of Christ. And that when it does impact us in that way, that then, God, it would impact us in the way that we live, in the way that we deal with the people we come in contact with, in the way that we deal with the people that are hard to come in contact with. That, God, we would see them as you see them. So, Lord, teach us today. As Moses prayed, Lord, we pray, teach us to number our days, to know how short life is, so that we might apply our hearts to wisdom and live for your glory. And we thank you in Christ's name. Amen.